tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are Don Murray and Gildart Jackson. Both are actor-directors. Don Murray was born and raised in Hollywood. He's had a long and varied career in TV and films, and you'll remember him in Knott's Landing and Bus Stop with Marilyn Monroe. He was nominated for an Oscar as Best Supporting Actor in the Bus Stop role. Uh, do people still remember you from that time? Yes, uh, they do, thanks to television reruns. Ah. You know, uh, your, <laughs> your youth never dies when, <laughs> when you do a movie with Marilyn Monroe. Were you good she, friends? She's your um, immortality. Yeah, were you friends of Marilyn's? <laughs> not, no, not really. I didn't really get to know her except on the set. I, ah. I never saw her. I never met her before the show, the movie started. Uh, I met her the first day I met her. It was at uh, costume fitting, just a few days before we started filming. Did you think you were going to, that you were in a great supporting role when you did that? Oh, I knew it was a great part because oh, I had did. seen it on Broadway. Uh, it was done by a wonderful actor named Albert Salmi on Broadway. Oh. And then I screen tested along with Albert Salmi and about 40, 50 other guys. <laughs> and I was fortunate enough to be selected for the role. Because there was always such a buzz. Uh, you know, you say Don Murray and they go, oh, bus stop. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and you've done hundreds of movies and films and TV appearances since then, and one of the things is your moral principle um, in Hollywood, which is hard to do with all the trash around. You've, you've made and written great films with um, honest heroes, I mean, patriotic heroes, and positive role models like priests and like the, uh, the what was it? The main the one was the Hudlin Priest, which was based on a real priest in St. Louis named Charles Dismas Clark. And he's called the hoodlum priest because he, his whole life mission was to take these men that were getting out, and sometimes women who were getting out of prison, and help them find a job and a place to live, and, and get them on the, on the straight and, and narrow, get them away from a life of crime. And as a matter of fact, he started the whole concept of the halfway houses. The first oh. halfway house was in St. Louis, and he wanted to have the film done because he wanted to complete that halfway house and have more built. And the film led to 75 more halfway houses being built in the United States. And finally, uh, over 150 in the United States uh, and Canada. And it all began with the film, The Hudlin Breeze. So you worked with him. Oh, yeah. Mostly then, you must have. Uh, another one was uh, um, Sweet Love Bitter. Oh, Sweet Love Bitter. That was very interesting. That was a, a marvelous film. Uh, about race, race relations, it was it was a fictionalized story with Charlie Parker, oh. and it was Charlie Parker who was, uh, as he was, a dope addict, but he befriends this white alcoholic, <laughs> and in taking care of this white alcoholic, it gets him off drugs, and they and they they both come through. But finally, the sad thing is that Charlie falls back into uh, drugs while while uh, the white guy finally frees himself from alcohol. And, and one other one, because we, we were, when I was reading about you, it was like all these positive things. So they, they start out kind of negative and then end up with positive <laughs> yeah. things, yeah. right? Yeah. The cross and the switchblade. Oh, the cross <laughs> and the switchblade. That was, that was a wonderful experience. Uh, that starred Pat Boone. He played a real-life character named David Wilkinson, who was a great country bumpkin uh, minister who had never even been in a big city. And he oh. read with horror about these gangs, these teenage gangs killing each other in New York City and Brooklyn. And he just went in there and, and started to live and was among these gangs, you know, and all this danger and all this violence going around. And he got the gangs together to stop killing each other. And, and uh, he, had, he, he, he made positive like, like uh, uh, youth clubs out of, out of these gangs. How did you find these stories? How did you find these people? Well, you know, actually, they both found me. Is it's that a what happened? It's a funny thing. I was, I was in St. Louis, and I was watching a screening of the movie I did with uh, James Cagney called Shake Hands with the Devil, 
was shot in Ireland about the Irish Revolution. Oh, sure. And uh, this priest came in and sat next to me and said, hey, Don, you know, I ain't one of them square priests. <laughs> oh, what? He talked just this like a hoodlum. Yeah, he talked like he was coming right out of jail himself. You know? <laughs> so he's talking to me while the pictures are going. I said, hey, Father, you know, I haven't seen my movie yet. I want to watch my movie, but I'm fascinated with this story. Come to the hotel room afterwards and tell me. So he came and he told me the story of his life. And then I went to United Artists with a 13-page outline. And I said, this is this guy, this, this, this uh, priest in, in St. Louis. He's called the Hoodlum Priest. And I gave him this outline. <laughs> and they gave me the money to make the movie. And then the movie came out. And they thought it was going to be the second half of a double, double bill, just a B picture. But when they saw it, the head of sales, Ben Heinemann, came out of the screen room. He was crying. And he sent off a telegram to all the salesmen. He says, I've just seen the Hoodlum Priest. And I want to tell you, it's one of the best films that United Artists ever made, and that includes every big block, block luster in our history. Who was in it? Who else uh, was in it? It was actually myself and a newcomer, De Keir DeLay. You, you oh, went on I, to have a oh, brilliant ca career. Mainly, he did uh, Space Odyssey, the first space, space Odyssey. He starred in that. He did won, you, did wonderful you, actor. Did Keir you DeLay. cast it? Did you yes. cast it? Yes. Oh, so you knew what you were looking for and what to find. Yeah, he was a brand new guy from New York, and uh, he came out in the audition, and he knocked us over. The director, Irvin Kirshner, and I both thought he was great, and my producing partner, Walter Wood. And so we chose him. It was his first movie. I remember when he made such a splash as such a great actor. Yeah. Oh, he was, he was wonderful. Well, from those do-good things with good endings, uh, your Knott's Landing character is sometimes called Saint Sid. <laughs> 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 Tell us about him. <laughs> well, uh, Sid was sort of the, the stable father figure amongst all this craziness that was going on in this uh, uh, cul-de-sac, you know. People with drinking problems and kids with drug problems and, uh, so, uh, you know, and uh, uh, musical chairs, marriages, and so on. And he was the, the stabilizing force. Now, I only stayed with the, uh, with the series the first two and a half years because uh, I had developed a series of my own, and uh, which was also a family series, and uh, it was about one family, and it was a musical family. And I was combining drama and musical, uh, because my my own kids were were composers oh, so were and musicians, using, ah. and I, I was using them as prototypes. I don't know if they would have acted in it, but they were the prototypes for the for the film. So you started that series. Well, you, uh, CBS bought it, but it was an hour comedy. It was a comedy drama. And CBS finally decided, well, there's no precedent for an, a one-hour comedy. So they bought it, but they never filmed it. Oh. So, so I, I didn't get but, to do but it. But back to, to Knott's Landing, was that one of the cliffhanger, kind of the beginning of cliffhanger episodes? Well, uh, you know, episodes? it was not a cliffhanger ep uh, epis uh, episodic when I went into Knott's Landing. Every story had a beginning, middle, and end. And it, it finished? Notes and finished. But uh, at the end of the first year, I wrote a script and I handed it to him. It's called Hitchhike. And they read the script, and they said, we love the script, but we're not going to do it this year. We want to do it next year as a premiere. And I said, oh, that's a nice way of telling me they don't, <laughs> they're not going to do the script. But then when it came to the premiere, they said, we're going to make it the premiere, but we want to make it our first two-parter. We want you to serialize it, and we want you to write it and expand it to two hours from one hour and make it serialized. And that was the beginning of Knott's Landing becoming serialized uh, on, oh. on the script that I wrote called Hitchhike. So that was really a cliffhanger in effect. Yes, it was. In effect, because yeah. then all the other series started doing that. Yeah, well, that's right. And, and then, then it became serialized from then on. Um, when it, you've done a lot of work. You've been working for how long? Years. Well, uh, <laughs> a few. <laughs> a few years. <laughs> But um, now you're working with your own family, which is great. Your kids are grown up. They're musicians. They're actors. They, they, they're all a part of the business. And you've just made a new film called Breathe. Yeah, this is a very exciting project. Breathe is based on the true life adventures of the man who's considered the greatest underwater filmmaker. His name is Tom Campbell, and he lives in Santa Barbara. Oh, he does? And you yes. live in Santa Barbara. That's right. I'm going to hold, th is this part of the... Th this is part of, actually, one of the, ma there are two main sequences of main dramas. And one is when uh, Tom Campbell and his wife and his best friend, they go lobster hunting. 
And while they're in this big cave, they didn't run a line into the cave because it was a big open cave and they'd been there many times. And he said, there's no way to get lost. But an undersea tremor came up and kicked up silt and they were totally blinded. And in order to try to get out, he said, everybody go to the ceiling and we'll just feel our way along the ceiling to get out. What he didn't know, there was another opening in the ceiling because he didn't know because he had never been up there before. There's no occasion to. And they got up into that opening and instead of taking them out, it took them deeper and deeper into the island. And they ended up, fortunately, they found an air pocket and they came up in the air pocket, but they discovered they only had enough air for one to try to get out and get help for the others. And, and so, this is a true story. And this is a true story. Now, what we did is, as you see this picture, first I'll sh- hold oh. this one up again. Okay. The Mont- I'll hold that. And that, that is, this is actually a real air pocket in the real cave. So they're We shot in, in the caves where this actually happened. And uh, we, we had to film through tunnels that were so narrow you could hear that uh, Mick and the other actors, their, their tanks were scraping along the oh walls. Oh my gosh. And they were trapped in there. And, and this one, this is the other major sequence, is when Tom and his wife were in a shark cage shooting great whites. And a great white came along and hit this cage with such force it knocked the air out. The cage sank to the bottom of the ocean. Now, they couldn't get out of the cage because there was a feeding frenzy above them. And this is one of the great white see. sharks that is actually part of the free feeding frenzy. The blood while, on there? Yes, I can while, see it. While Tom was down below, a photographer on the deck shot this shot of this actual shark in the feeding frenzy. So we have all this in the, in the picture. And there, as I said, there was no sets. Nothing is computer generated. Uh, generated. Everything you see in that movie actually happened. Real sharks, real divers, real caves. But with actors. But with actors, yes. And actors are? And my son, Mick Murray, wrote the screenplay because he's a diver and he's experienced it. He uh-huh. wrote the screenplay. He plays the leading role, Tom Campbell. My other son, Christopher Murray, who is my, my son by Hope Lang, the, the great actress Hope Lang, and uh, he plays sort of an antagonist diver in the, in the show. And then my other son, Sean Murray, is a composer, and, and he wrote the music. And he's an interesting uh, career because uh, he started out, sold his first music to television at age 15. And he's the only person I know who's in the arts that never had to do anything else. He didn't weigh tables? He, he never weighed tables <laughs> because from the time he was 15, he scored his first movie at 19. And he's been in so much in demand ever since that he's never had to do anything else. Well, isn't that we had lucky. to wait from him, as a matter of fact. To you get had to him wait for, for him to yeah, do we, the music? We did, yeah. But, but this movie now, Breathe, is uh, in a lot of film festivals. Well, it just was in... Uh, Santa Barbara Film Festival. And then it's going to be at... Yes, it's going to be... We're, we're, we were invited to the Fort Lauderdale Film Festival. Which is a great place for it, this. It's a wonderful place for it, but that's not until November. When I told them, I said, well, that's too late for us. They said, well, what, when could you come? I said, well, I could come in April. And they said, we're not going to wait for the festival. We're going to make a special event uh, built around your movie. So they're presenting the movie both at the Florida Atlantic University in oh. uh, Boca Raton and then they're also doing it in Fort Lauderdale. So it, the whole event is going to be built around Breathe. So you don't call Breathe a documentary? Oh, no, it's not what at all. What do you call it? It's a dramatization. It's, it's a it's, dramatization, it's, yes, it so it's like... It's just based on, on real events. It's just like you know, Sergeant York was a great... Uh, and you were out. Thing. You were out in the water. Did you oh, get yeah. seasick? <laughs> oh, no. My only, my only recommendation as a director for this movie is I don't get seasick. There's no way I would go down into those caves <laughs> where I sent my sons. <laughs> Absolutely no way. But I, I am uh, perfectly comfortable on the water. And three quarters of the film is on or underwater, and over half is underwater all through these, these uh, caves. And, and also we have these wonderful scenes that we shot out in Catalina with giant bass, sea bass. They're sea bass that are over six feet long and weigh over oh. 700 pounds. Wow. And they're endangered species and very rare. And when we were filming, they just happened to come along when we were filming. And they came in and they stopped right in front of our cameras. And they and stopped was, and breathed. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it, 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 it was as if they were extras in the movie. That's great. Thank you, Don. <laughs> it's a real pleasure. Thank you. And thanks for watching this part of the Joan Quinn Profile. We'll be right back with Gildart Jack.
Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Actor, director, writer, Gildart Jackson was born and raised in England. He graduated from Birmingham University with a Bachelor of Laws. Gildart came to the United States in the late 80s, passed the California bar, and practiced as an entertainment lawyer in Beverly Hills. This is a new one on me. They always say that lawyers are good actors, but you took it literally. <laughs> yeah, well, I think I think actually all lawyers really want to be actors, and that's why they do it. And that's what I think. Frustrated. Were, were you were you uh, uh, in court? I was trained as a barrister in England, mm -hmm. but I, ne I, I sort of left England before I practiced. I came to America and I sort of messed around for a couple of years, and then I took came to California, yeah. and I had designs on the movie business, but I was kind of too afraid to really just pursue it. Oh, you really did? Yeah, yeah, So yeah. you went into entertainment law? Yeah, I, I thought this, you know, there are many powerful people in LA, and a lot of them are lawyers, so <laughs> why don't I just, I'm a lawyer, so why don't I just qualify here? How'd you do that? I just took the bar. You took the bar, and you so passed you, it, which is tough. Uh, yeah, it, it was, was tough. Yeah. And then you got into an entertainment firm? Then I, th th then I made the mistake, because the first job I got was as a music lawyer. Oh. So uh, I kind of wasn't really interested in that uh, from a future perspective, but I was interested in that just as a, as a lawyer. So I, I went on and was as quite successful, and uh, I was asked <laughs> to become a partner. But then I realized that I needed to move on because I wasn't really very happy doing what I was doing. But that was a good kind of background for you, wasn't it? Or was it? Not no? Really. Not really. It <laughs> was just a lot of time spent doing something that I didn't really want to do. <laughs> so then what was the motivation that actually got you to leave? I think meeting Melora, who was a guest on your show. Melora, your wife, My, the actress? That's right. Uh, she was living a life that I was really interested in living. Um, she was working as an actor. She was loving what she was doing. And we sort of met and fell in love, and, and that introduced me to that world, which I'd always been afraid of getting into. Oh, you're kidding. Did you start taking acting lessons then? I did. When I was a lawyer, I was, I was sort of sneaking off in the evenings and oh, taking Oh, you were? Where? Just to local? At the Lee Strasberg Th Theater Institute. Oh, you were? Um, and then, really, it Well, was did you have that feeling when you were taking acting lessons? Did you really like it? Were you really into yeah, it then? I always was really into <coughs> it. And Melora's a terrific actress, and her father's an actor. That's right, that's right. So was that kind of a help for you? Um, that my father-in-law, well, prospectively, was yeah. that an actor? Uh, <coughs> I think he would have said, you know, the last thing you should do is become an actor. Uh. But, uh, but uh, just to see that world. Because the acting classes are one thing, but actually seeing the world of people who are actually making a living, doing that is, is a different thing. And it's something that I was never exposed to as a child. But they were very happy actors. They yeah. were working actors. Yeah. He was a, more of a character he's, actor. He's probably what you'd call a character actor. But he's, working all the time. Yeah, he's fantastic. And, and, and he's been in lots and lots of stuff. And um, in that regard, the there is a... You, I'm here under slightly false pretenses because I'm not a director. Melora directed the movie that, that you have a new movie made. calling you called you called you. Although it might change its title, but we're in the, she actually directed it. She directed it. I wrote it, and we both produced it together, and we're both in it. Uh -huh. But the similarity between uh, sort of the story of our movie and the story of Don's movie is that it involves our families. Um, both like, of you, like yes. his, like his, ours is something that involves Melora and me, m our daughters, both of our daughters oh, are in it, daughters too. and uh, my father-in-law and mother-in-law are both in it, and a whole bunch of friends. How did you cast it? Just from well, your I family? Wrote, <laughs> I wrote it sort of with, uh, with our family in mind. I mean, it was, it was autobiographical. It's fictional, but it's, it uh. was... Uh, the, the personalities in it. What is it? Just give us a quick rundown. I was... Since you're not directing since it. Since I'm not directing Actually, it. I can tell you what I wrote about <laughs> Yeah, tell us what you uh, wrote about. Um, I, Melora and I had just had our first child, and she was about six months old, and we were lying in bed together, and Melora said to me, we were sort of holding her, and she said, God, I'm such a dork. I just was having a daydream about the speech that I'm going to give at her wedding. Oh. Sort of 20 years from yeah. now, the speech that she's going to give to give away her, her daughter. And I then went to go and do a TV show up in Vancouver, and I was really missing my family. And I sat down one day, and I had written some stuff, but I'd, uh, I'd never <coughs> written this way. I sat down, I had like a long weekend off, and I just wrote 
Just by hand? Uh, no, I typed, but, but I, wrote, I wrote the story. It just came out very, very quickly. And it's the story about a guy. It's an extension of me missing them. It's about a guy who this happens to. They're together, and then the wife dies. So the wife comes back throughout the history of this child and this father oh. uh, sort of as a ghost. So she's in the background. Yeah, to help me bring up my daughter, our daughter. And at the end of the movie, the final scene is where I am giving her away at her actual wedding 20 years later. And I give the speech that she gave. But she told you that right. night that right. she had given to you on, when she was thinking about right. it. Is uh, the music part of the family too? Who did the music? Well, friends did the music. Um, and it's not completely done, but we have a lot of friends who are musicians, and um, there's, there are several great songs. And uh, Melora's, one of her best friends is Paula Cole, who is a Grammy-winning artist who's very kind of giving us a song. And so she gave you a song? She's writing, a, she's writing the end title the song. The uh, Melora is an actress, but she took her first directing. She wants That's to right. direct. So we she had was always doing some stage directing, right? She, had, she did a play. She directed a play. And we had always wanted to work together, and I came back with this thing, and I didn't really have a sense of whether it was a movie, but it was just something that I really had enjoyed writing, and she read it, and it's, you know, it's a very tearful story, but she was <laughs> like, this is the thing I want to direct. This is the first movie I want to direct. Oh. And so, and it was great because we could involve our family and do it that way as opposed was to- Was it hard? For, she had to direct it. I mean, you wrote it and you were acting, but was it hard to get them to, to actually act? I mean, your mother-in-law, is she an actress? She, she was an actress. Oh, she, so she, she, I mean, yeah, everybody who acted in the movie w is an established actor. I see. Except your children. Except our children, who, who were kids. And, and the, the little one was just in it, as, you know, in that opening like. scene, sort of, uh, she's just there, Googling. She's, she's six months old at the time. Uh, and then the five-year-old uh, is in it, too, and she, she was fantastic. It was just lovely to see her enjoy it. How long did it take to film it? 18 days. That's all? Mm -hmm. Where'd you do it? <laughs> We'd, at our house, at friends' houses, around Los Angeles. Oh, that's um, so great. So, I mean, that's independent filmmaking, yeah, it isn't it? Yeah, it is its an best. independent film. And... and uh, and, and having all these friends and having all these people who can be involved in it who are professionals. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, we're lucky in that the, the quality of acting and all of our friends, you know, musically, right. cinematographically. Right. Uh, we have people who actually work in this business and, and are very good at what they do, helping us out. And, and you produced it. I produced, you produced it. I got it, my feet wet. I didn't know what I, what I was doing about producing it. But, but you didn't direct it. I did not direct it. When you started acting, Gilda, did you uh, start on the soaps? You you I, had a character on General, on General Hospital. Hospital. Yeah, that was one of the early jobs I got. Was it? Did yeah. You, was it easy for you to get those kind of jobs then? Um, that that particular job uh, just came without even an audition, um, and it was a little part originally, and then they just hired me again for for a lo much longer deal. Um, and Charmed? That's just another, you know, I was on, in the seventh season, I did eight episodes were the, Those were the beginnings, though. Were they the beginnings of your career? Uh, no, initially I, I did, I did, I did, there's all sort of jobs that I've done. Yeah. I was on that for five episodes as a sort of recurring character and... Uh, yeah, but five times, seven times, those yeah. are all like yeah. <laughs> your resume. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I, you know, I've enjoyed all of those things. They're great. It was, uh, but uh, now I think that the intention that we have now is to continue trying to make movies this way. It depends what happens with this film. Well, ha what do you do with it next? We haven't quite finished it. It's almost, the picture's almost locked, which means that after that we can finish the sound and the color uh -huh. and timing. And you, of the you have a hand in all of that, of No, course. Melora is, oh, she, has, a hand she, is, she is, has the hand in deciding, you know, what the movie is going to how it like, finishes? How it, yeah. Um, I'm merely just organizing. And then what do you do? Once it's finished. Then we try to get various festivals, I think, probably uh -huh. first to, to show it.